Well, wonderful. Welcome again. Uh, my name is Joshua. Um, I, I'm a fellow with the forum. And uh, today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Paul Ewart, who will then introduce our main speaker, uh, Professor Stan Rosenberg, who will give us uh, an insightful discussion on Augustine. Uh, Professor Paul Ubert is former director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, professor of physics at the University of Oxford, and a tutor and fellow of Worcester College. I, I hand it over to you now, Professor Ewert. Okay, thank you very much, Joshua. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Stan Rosenberg, who's going to lead this seminar on what's really a critical idea that has colored Christian theology really for centuries and whose books go right back to St. Augustine. Dr. Rosenberg is especially qualified to speak in this subject, as you'll soon realize, for not only is he an eminent example of scholarship in Oxford, he actually founded and currently directs scholarship and Christianity in Oxford, which is an important aspect of the work of the Council of Christian Colleges and Universities in the USA. He's also a tutor in church history at Wycliffe Hall here in Oxford, and an associate of the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion at the University. He's um, actually led several um, very important uh, projects and in, in research initiatives um, in the field of science and religion. This shows that he's not only a good scholar, but a great fundraiser. And he's also a fellow of the International Society for Science and Religion, and also on the Faculty of Theology and Religion in the University of Oxford here where he's an acknowledged expert on Augustine himself. So you'll agree that we could have no one better to help us consider the question, can nature be read in tooth and claw in the thought of Augustine? So I'll hand over to Stan now. Well, uh, Paul, thank you. And to Thea and to the team, it's a delight to uh, join in on this. My thanks for the uh, very warm introduction. And I'm delighted to be having working with you all on some old friends here on the uh, screen, as well as new people to meet. And uh, I'm really uh, grateful for this opportunity to uh, share something of this work. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you'll have been having some problems with PowerPoint. Are you all seeing this, uh, this screen now okay? Okay, so I've been having uh, today some uh, PowerPoint Zoom issues. So uh, apologies if this goes uh, south. Um, hopefully this will, will stay north though, um, or, or uh, pear shape might be the other description for it. Uh, so um, I do work on Augustine. I have uh, worked across just some background of myself. I'm Augustine scholar who uh, was able to train with some, uh, my, uh, my mentors in Augustine were several of the great Augustine scholars who really opened up the door to me to be thinking about this more broadly, I did my training many years ago now at the Catholic University of America in Washington and have been on the faculty here for 23 years here at Oxford, uh, working away on these various subjects. And I split my time between working on subjects that deal with ancient exegesis, uh, ancient cosmology, and then modern science and religion issues. And I particularly also work in um, ancient ideas of oral culture and transmission of ideas in oral culture. So all this. This comes to, together in this sort of topic uh, as I work on that. This is a topic you'll soon learn was something that was born of something of a, uh, perhaps not an existential crisis, but certainly an intellectual crisis for me, uh, engaging with, as I engage with issues of, uh, of thought and of uh, working through modern issues of science and our understanding and wrestling through a best understanding of uh, how we understand the processes and uh, combining that with, uh, with the traditions of thought. And what I want to present to you is um, uh, relevant, I think, to understanding Augustine. It's also relevant to understanding tra traditions of an interpretation. And I'd like you to, as I'm presenting this, be thinking about this. Perhaps you're interested specifically in Augustine, so understanding Augustine as impact, but also to think of it as a case study, because what I hope to convince you of or to present, or maybe you'll convince me that I'm wrong in the discussion afterwards in your critiques and challenges. But what I hope to convey is something of a case day of how a tradition, how we can misunderstand and misinterpret a tradition of thinking in a way that it becomes instantiated in an 
embedded in our way of thinking and therefore perhaps wrongly can limit us in the, what, what we understand of the theological framing by which we engage issues. So let me just start with this. I grew up, uh, my father was a medievalist, so you could say I inherited the family business. Uh, and uh, if you actually look around my office, more, you know, look at these bookshelves, uh, more than a few of the family uh, treasures, uh, as in my father's books are up on the shelves here. Uh, he used to say this to me all the time. It was a phrase that came home to me particularly when I visited Venice in uh, 2001. Uh, he used to say, a text without a context is a pretext. That's a historian's kind of comment or quote. And it came home to me in this image. This is an image of Augustine that sat above my desk many years ago as I was doing my dissertation at Catholic University. Many of us here will know the long, dark night of the soul that we described elsewhere as doing a PhD dissertation. And uh, I had this image printed above and in large scale, printed and sitting above my desk as I did it. Uh, for anyone interested in Augustine and ancient science as I was, this was a uh, red meat. So if you look at this image, um, to, uh, to the upper right of, a, this is Augustine, well, it's actually the, uh, the face is the, uh, would have been the Cardinal of Venice at the time, but not, that, that's the way ancient art and patronage or medieval and Renaissance uh, art and patronage work. But anyway, there's Augustine of sorts looking out the window and uh, you see above him to the right, one of Ptolemy's or Millery spheres. And if you look down below, just below the desk, you can't see it very well, but there's a time clock, time piece, a sand clock. Uh, there's a nocturnal for looking at the night sky uh, and uh, other instruments there. If you look in the closet on the left, there are uh, astrolabes, all sorts of instruments of a, uh, uh, for scientific study, if you will, of the heavens. Uh, this is an interesting representation of Augustine, and uh, it tells you something of what they thought of medieval uh, or, or Renaissance era of how a Renaissance uh, era bishop was understood and thought. It's actually quite interesting. I don't know how many bishops today we would think would have, be surrounded by these sorts of instruments, but that's another kind of conversation. I'll leave that one aside and let others think about that. So you can imagine me working on my dissertation on Augustine's uh, De Genesis ad Literum, his literal commentary on Genesis and working through ancient, uh, Greco -Roman si ancient and Greco-Roman science as a part of that, or natural philosophy. They wouldn't have used the word science, of course, but working through natural philosophy of the period. Um, this was, could be an inspiring image. But it wasn't until I got to Venice and saw this image in situ that I realized that this image had very little to do with Augustine. Augustine is actually not the, uh, is not the image that one should be looking at here, but actually it comes in a context of the life of Jerome, because it, this was a, uh, a, a set of uh, 10 images uh, that's in the oratorio uh, on the life of Jerome. And this is image of Augustine follows the death of Jerome. So you have there in the images, two of the other images from the series painted on the wall of the skull to the Dalmatian sailors. You have uh, uh, Jerome and Golden uh, Legend with the lion there, and then you've got the death of Jerome. And so if I go back to this, this is Augustine either miraculously or in writing, and he's reflecting on it. I uh, get here learning of Jerome's death, his erstwhile opponent. They were uh, not the happiest of colleagues, if you will. I won't go take time to go into that, but it was an unhappy set of relationships in many ways, a uh, very contentious set of relationship that defined them. So this is Augustine reflecting on that. It has nothing to do with science and religion. It has nothing to do uh, with uh, what I interpreted it to be. It was still inspiring to me, but I got it wrong. A text without a context is a pretext. And as we think about this issue of understanding nature and Augustine's way of shaping us, I think that's an important way to think about it, that to an important reminder, the text without a context is a pretext. We can misjudge. Now, before I go into it, I just want to make the disclaimer, because we have many different backgrounds represented uh, here in this, uh, in this group, and people will bring different particular skills and knowledge, and many of you far superior to me in different areas. 
of skill that you bring. I think it's important to say that I'm approaching this as a historian, not as a statistician, not as a philosopher. I'm not looking for the best option. I'm not trying to defend a particular position, but my job, if you will, is first and foremost to clean out the weeds so others can come in and plant better seeds. Uh, so often we have to weed the garden. Um, and uh, my job as a historian especially is to do a bit of weeding. That is to get the best story uh, clear in, in front of our heads to understand what shapes us, what are the ideas, what has their impact been, why they developed as they have. And uh, I do have theological views. And I, do I do care about what is the best view, uh, but my skill set and my focus is trying to get clarity on what has come before us so that we can be better positioned to define how we move forward and think about it. Now, when we talk about Augustine, it's important to remember that we have different ways of understanding and interpreting Augustine and thinking about him. And we have, all have different images. For some of you, this may be the image. I doubt it actually, but for many, this might be the image. So here's an image from the sixth century from the, uh, from the Lateran Palace of a type of image of Augustine, something that might actually be his face. I don't think there's very good reason to think I'd, you could, there's not a strong argument for it. It's an interesting observation, but I wouldn't make too much of that. But that gives you a sense of what a late antique bishop sitting on his cathedral would look like. So it more places him. Maybe for some of you, you have Augustine as a little bit more of an abstraction, like the face piece of this manuscript, the, the inner folio of the manuscript of the City of God. So there's an abstraction of Augustine. And that might be how you envision Augustine. Or for some of you, it might be a uh, from uh, Botticelli, this is Augustine's the second from the left. Uh, there's Augustine, and what's he doing? He's writing. There's Augustine, the, Augustine the author, writing his book. Uh, perhaps for some of you, it's this other painting of Botticelli, Augustine the visionary, Augustine the mystic, Augustine uh, the contemplative, and that's whom you think of. For many around us, this might be the uh, image of Augustine that dominates. Uh, Augustine, rate the hammer of God, raining down authority on Pelagius, the Donatists, and others, anyone who has gotten in the way of good thought. And here's Augustine, the powerful. Um, for a few others, and I think primarily for me, this is the image that really reigns. This is from the, uh, from the high altar uh, in St. Peter's. Uh, the altar of the four doctors, the statues of the four doctors around the high altar, uh, sorry, the rear altar, and this is Augustine the preacher. There he's standing, and the, that's the image of uh, declamation. Augustine's preaching, he's got a Bible there in front of him, is the way his hands out, that's the symbol of declamation. For Augustine, who gave somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 sermons, that's the image that I find most informative of all these. Um, Augustine wrote 94 books, 93 extant. There are about, uh, depending on how you count them, up to 28 other books that people will, uh, 28 other writings that people will call books. But for Augustine, he thought of them as letters. So I count them amongst his letters because that as a genre is where he's, what they were. It's such that they were so long, they were sometimes placed amongst his books. Uh, and again, he gave somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 sermons of which we have 950 still existing uh, in some format, many in full length, some are fragmentary, but that's really a, a stunning uh, set for uh, ancient culture to have that much available. Uh, just to situate Augustine, if you're not very familiar with him, born in 354, died in 430, and there's uh, some of his major works uh, within that frame. And I work especially on the work of his maturity, the literal commentary on Genesis. Now, let me uh, jump into why this topic. As I mentioned, uh, this came out of a kind of intellectual crisis for me. Uh, so in some ways, it's been one of the more interesting projects that I've worked, because you will find people, especially John Hick, the philosopher, you will find some theologians, uh, as well as even patristic scholars, who will argue that Augustine taught that uh, the cosmos itself is broken and alienated from God as a result of the fall, that with the, with the uh, disobedience in the garden, something went awry with creation itself, that the whole cosmos is broken, distorted, and torn apart. And it suffers then 
um, along with humans in this, in, in as a result of the fall, that our human action has somehow distorted the cosmos and distorted it away from God, that there's a separation between the cosmos and God that was not part of the original design. Now, why this spur intellectual crisis? Well, for me, I'm uh, in my context and what I'm what I was working through is I'm an Augustine scholar. I'm an Augustine scholar who would say I'm deeply indebted to Augustine's theological vision that has shaped much. There's there are pieces of Augustine I dislike. There are parts that I disagree with. There are parts that I don't use. But there are substantial parts of an Augustinian vision that has positively shaped my engagement, my understanding, my own theological reflection and work. You put that on one side. On the other, I work very much with, the, with many scientists like Paul. Uh, Paul and I have worked together, for example, at over the several years of, uh, of supporting conversation between uh, philosophers, theologians, and scientists at Oxford called the Oxford Forum. I worked uh, with another Paul here in the meeting, Paul Allen, and I have been part of a project called Bridging Two Cultures, where we're bringing together uh, theologians, philosophers, and life scientists, and natural scientists for several summers of conversation. And I am uh, engaged with, and I would say positively engaged with, and uh, uh, would not have quibbled with uh, contemporary uh, interpretations of biological evolution. But this leads to then its own problem. Uh, for me, it was the evil problem. Uh, and I'll come to in a moment what I mean by privation, but can Augustine's account of evil with his, uh, uh, be uh, reconciled to a notion of nature being red in tooth and claw? So if you know this phrase, nature red in tooth and claw, of course, comes from the poem, but uh, how can we understand a good creation being separated from God and reconcile that to the notion that uh, of biological evolution that there's there's no point in our in the in our understanding of the natural world when there hasn't been destruction, when there hasn't been death and decay and uh, pain, that it's endemic to any kind of evolutionary uh, interpretation, and I'm not using that interpret word interpretation lightly, but in terms of understanding the how of the cosmos, cataclysm and loss has always been a part of it. We can't somehow point it towards a period after the fall. So biological and physical evidence argues for and gives a massive evidence for violence and cataclysm before any kind of historic time. And yet we have in this Augustinian theology and the theological tradition an approach evil marked by privation that there was a primal purity and that fall corroded that original state. Do these two statements cancel themselves out? So this is my problem. This was my intellectual crisis, if you will, of how uh, do I need to uh, kind of reconcile these or do I need to somehow say, come to the conclusion that I have a problem with the best interpretations that I come across and understand and engage with around uh, the development of the world around us or the theological tradition that has really shaped me. Can I maintain these? So that's what was behind this study. So let me just say a few things in terms of shaping it and, uh, and then the materials. So for Augustine, cosmology is central. Now, uh, for astronomers in the room, uh, ancient cosmology was not astronomy as we use it today. Ancient cosmology was a species or form of ancient metaphysics a way of interpreting the underlying structure of reality. And for Augustine, he was preoccupied with this. Five different chapter uh, commentaries on Genesis. Uh, and just look some of those figures there. He's citing Genesis 1-1 more than 700 times. John 1, I didn't even go through how many times the different verses in John. That became too much of, a, of an ordeal to try and uh, fill out that. Or the many times that he quotes the cosmological Psalms. Uh, this was nothing short of a massive preoccupation for Augustine. His conversion came in part through this, that is, in listening to his mentor Ambrose's sermons on a hexameron. Hexameron was an ancient description for a for way of presenting the opening uh, chapters of Genesis. In Ambrose's sermons on Genesis 1 to 3, uh, he, 
played a key role clearly in Augustine's conversion, helped drawing him away from the Manichaean tradition that he had been caught up in. Or as he was already, it was actually not drawing him away. He was already being drawn away and finding problems with, with the Manichaean, the Gnostic theology he had inherited or had identified with. It showed him a path forward in part. These chapters on cosmology helped Augustine work out key questions where he worked out uh, Flatio ex nihilo. We, we, today, the term we typically use more broadly is creation out of nothing or creatio ex nihilo. His phrase was Flatio ex nihilo that he used most. And working through this idea of formation, deformation, reformation, it provides a structure for him to understand the world. And he defines uh, the opening chapters of Genesis in a way that would be very different than modern interpretations, either scientific or uh, many Christian or, or a, uh, Jewish interpretations of Genesis. Uh, for him, Genesis 1 and 2 uh, were primarily about his revelation to the angels about the purposes of the cosmos. This was not presented, understood by Augustine as natural history. Uh, this was not a, uh, in, in some ways it wasn't even a revelation to the humans. It's almost like us being able to listen in as God is revealing to the, to the angels why he created heavens and earth and why he created humans. And uh, so it was a form of figurative and typology uh, and allegorical all interspersed. And for him, the Genesis 1 and 2 are not two different accounts. They are about different aspects of, the co of creation. Genesis 1 was about uh, the underlying, if you will, somewhat using this term in air quotes, natural laws. Uh, it was a about the creation of the underlying natural laws, the rationes that would drive the cosmos. And then Genesis 2, the implementation or administration of that over time. Let me just back up and give a, a, and say that for Augustine, reading scripture was always a, the question of hermeneutics was critical. Um, that uh, for him, signs are obscure matters. Human signs are obscure, and the Bible is written in human signs, but with divine reality underlying it. And so we have to break through the cultures and the signs. And his work on sign theory, De Doctrina Christiana, sometimes uh, translated as on Christian instruction, sometimes translated as on Christian doctrine. That word doctrine there, I would use provisionally, don't think of in terms of the modern meaning of the word doctrine. It's much more about the structure of teaching and thought. Uh, this was an, a, a significant work that helped him frame the way he thinks about these issues uh, in terms of working through the hermeneutics. Uh, and so what Augustine comes to is that literal is, should be understood when he talks about literal interpretation. He doesn't mean literal as the word has gotten used and particularly in North America in the last 80 or so years, more like 120 years, I suppose. Uh, it doesn't mean as I mean the word, as I find the word to mean it, but it meant as the author intended it. So if an author intended something to be interpreted figuratively, a literal interpretation would be to be figurative. If the author intended it to be typology or allegory, that's the way a literal interpretation honors that and works according to that interpretation. So the hard business is to find out what the author meant. Back to Cosmos. For Augustine, he works out a theology uh, which, in which uh, that explains the ongoing governance of activity in nature. For him, as he works this out in terms of Genesis 1, not all reasons or these underlying causes or natural laws are always evident, and some are only employed for a particular purpose. One bit of sidelight, this wasn't really picked up on after Darwin uh, until 1879, so about 20, uh, 20 years after the origin, uh, the publication of Origin of Species, he started to have a series of articles coming out from theologians uh, who brought in Augustine either for or against Darwin, depending on how they read it. And there are a series of back and forth articles over about the next 30 years of trying to apply uh, a, a De Genesia Literum to Darwinian theology. I'm not sure that's quite what works, but it's an interesting sense of what happened. Um, but in this, what I want to convey is that Augustine develops a way of understanding the ongoing operations of nature. Uh, and what he's working against is the capriciousness of 
paganism, of pagan and Roman religion in particular on one side, where they're constantly having to play off of the different gods and I, they're, uh, and as well as the household gods, the, the, the main gods on one hand. But there's also the volunteerism that was a part of his own uh, theological and Christian tradition he inherited from Ambrose. So for his mentor Ambrose, if it rains, it's because God caused it to rain. So all physical phenomena, all natural phenomena was directly related to the specific intervention of God. So it only rains because God caused it to rain. Now you can do the math on that, but you can't do the math on that, it's too impossible. But every particular action in the natural world was down to a specific causal decision of the divine. Uh, and that was true for both the pagans in terms of the pagan capriciousness or the providential and uh, volunteerism of some of the Christians like Ambrose around him. And Augustine in his work is really moving substantially away from that. And in Latin tradition really gives, and you have some similar thinking going on amongst the Cappadocians and being developed simultaneously amongst Cappadocian thinkers, but on the Greek side, but on the Latin side, Augustine is really the first developing this to this extent. So you have this in this quote here that you've probably been reading while I've been talking that, and that, that's a positive statement by the way, I'm glad you're, if you're doing that, I'm glad you're doing that. Um, that God moves his creation by his hidden power, by all creatures subject to the movement, stars moving their courses, the winds blowing on earth, meadows coming to life. What he's giving us is a sense of a process, a design, a structure. And this is an important part of Augustine's thinking. Uh, so we have this, God unfolds the generations which he laid up in creation. By the way, that's, that, that becomes the form of the word that we would use for secular or saculum. When, and they wouldn't be sent run uh, forth to run their courses if he who made creatures ceased to exercise his provident administration over them. So there's this underlying providence that structures it, that creates a structure. And there is this underlying aspect that holds it together. He's reflecting on the Colossians text there. And yet it has its own, if you will, uh, its own quality. It is able to run. It doesn't require a constant intervention. The, the nature of the elements have, the, have an order. He's, by the way, he's using Stoic language there and sto drawing upon Stoic physics as a part of his thinking in that. And I'll push on through this so we can uh, get to some conversation. So I get to this longer quote from uh, his you know, literal interpretation of Genesis, De Genesis Literum. The whole course of nature, of which we're so familiar, has certain natural laws of its own, according to which both the spirit of life, which is a creature, has drives and urges that are somehow predetermined, which even a bad will cannot bypass. So things work because of how they're set up. And the elements of this natural world have their own distinct energies and qualities, which determine which each is capable of or what cannot be done. It's from these baselines that whatever comes to be or takes on its own particular time spans, risings in progress, its ends and settings according to the thing that is. Now, it's of this that Augustine began to think about the way uh, one thing can develop another. He would even think about this. This would be quite a driving way, but this is how he would account for miracles as well, uh, because you couldn't have accidental, complete accidental forms for Augustine. So even the Miracles that show up are special design, um, if you will, ratione that were hidden away just for that special purpose. So Christ walking on water was a hidden ratione that only occurred and was brought out especially at that time. So it wasn't God breaking the rule, the laws of nature by Christ walking on water. It was a hidden or unused one that was pulled out at that moment. So Augustine's really concerned about consistency, obviously. Well, what are some of the implications? Augustine presents a natural world that's created, that's contingent, that's rational, that's capable of being understood to some degree by humans. You know, something we just say in this context, it's really Augustine on the Latin side that first gives us a developed doctrine of creation of nothing. Before this time, Caratio ex nihilo or Facio ex nihilo was used largely for apologetic purposes. So it was uh, the, the idea begins with Philo in, in a Middle Judaism. So in a Jewish context, it comes out, begins with Philo, gets picked up in the second century by the Apol Christian apologists uh, uh, and used, but used solely in that context for apologetic purposes against Gnostics. It doesn't have any kind of do serious doctrinal development or reflection, it isn't incorporated into broader doctrinal thinking. 
Um, this is true into the third century. And then in the fourth century, you begin to get some development of thinking about this uh, with Athanasius. So in his work on the incarnation, you begin to get some development of thinking around this as a doctrinal position. And the Cappadocians and Augustine simultaneously then begin to develop it uh, as a theological view. So Augustine is the first to really, on the Latin side, create a doctrine around creation out of nothing, not just as, a, not just as an assertion or as a, an apologetic camp tool, but as a doctrinal tool that's part of the overall framework of his thinking. And this gives, then, a different way for him as he's thinking about these issues to think about the problem of evil, and this becomes very important. So he develops the doctrine of privatio boni, or uh, privation of the good. Uh, for him, evil, for Augustine, is a corruption or a corrosion of good. So there's an underlying assumption. All things are created by God. You know, an underlying concern. All things are created by God. So if to describe evil as a thing is to present it as somehow then God being the cause, because all things come from God. So evil can't be a thing. It has to be nothing. But he's not doing nothing as in, uh, as in a, if you will, a, a something like what you find in certain Eastern religion views. It's not a deception. It is literally not a thing. It's a quality. It's an absence of the good. But it couldn't be complete absence. Otherwise, nothing would be left. There would be no thing. So evil is a corruption or corrosion. It's a bit like my bicycle I ride here in Oxford. I have an old bike that I keep in the uh, back garden for riding into town for meetings. Because I've had my good bicycle stolen uh, in town, across from Christchurch, while there for a graduate seminar. Um, it's it is my old bike has a really horrible chain on it. I like good things. I don't like this bicycle. It's not a very good thing. Um, it's got a corrupted chain, a corroded chain. It's full of rust. But the thing about that bike is I can still use it. For Augustine, privation undermines the quality, the structure, the integrity of a thing. But that doesn't mean it's, it's completely bad. It means it is deeply afflicted. And there can be different degrees of affliction or corrosion. And for Augustine, then, that explains how we understand the world around us. It's corroded. It's, it's, things are afflicted. But the question is, does privation apply purely? I just use a natural example that is the chain. But Augustine actually doesn't apply it. This is the mistake that was made by Hick and others. Augustine, as you'll see in a moment, applies privation to the human soul, not to the natural world. That is, privation should not be confused with decay. It's moral corruption, not physiological corruption. And that distinction is all critical in this conversation. I'll move through the rest of this quickly so we can get to discussion. So there are uh, some quotes. Uh, I'll be glad to make these quotes available. Uh, so if you don't have to uh, go write them down if you're, if you're interested in following up on this. Um, he distinguishes between moral evil and physiological decay. They're not one and the same thing. Uh, so we have this, humans lost their natural state of being as a result of sin. Evil is the removal of good, but it's not, he's not talking about, again, physical, about nature in its own right. So he distinguishes between natural states, decay in natural states, and moral evil. Um, wickedness is described of things that have will, not nature. He even, for example, in the Confessions, uh, describes a viper and a worm as being good things. So we don't have suddenly in Augustine, as sometimes would have been said or asserted by others, that Augustine, that suddenly you've got um, a, things like snakes becoming poisonous, or mosquitoes are born because of the fall, or you know, name your poison, that this comes as a result. This is certainly not part of Augustine's thinking. And for Augustine, this is a core philosophical problem. And it doesn't, you know, we've got philosophers, at least one philosopher, maybe many philosophers in the room. Um, this is a clear philosophical principle. That anything that can be made can be unmade. That there is decay is, is a part of the natural world. Chain, anything that has changed will have decay. And Augustine thinks in terms of this. 
the very ordinary and accustomed course of nature, whereby the seasons are rapidly revolved and all things after kinds are ever temporal and are perishable. So decay is part of any kind of contingent being. If the cosmos is contingent, there will be decay. And that doesn't make it blameworthy. Blame comes when there is a will involved, and that will has chosen something else. And he nowhere in all my reading of Augustine, now I haven't read all of Augustine. I would be pretty disbelieving of most people who say they've assert, who assert that they've read all of Augustine's works, given how substantial they are. I, my mentor, uh, Gerald Bonner said that, and I would believe that I believed wholly Gerald because of who he was and what he brought to it. But the, the number of people who I believe on that um, are few. But I will say, of everything I've read of Augustine, which is a large amount, I've never seen him argue that there was decay and violence, and chaos only after the fall as a result of the fall. Now he would do, describe certain types that come in, but not to say that there was no such thing. And in fact, you'll see in a moment a quote that suggests quite the even more strongly quite the opposite. Here we have from City of God, Book 12, Chapter 4. It would be ridiculous to regard the defects of beasts, trees, and other mutable and moral beings which lack intelligence, sense of life, as deserving condemnation. That's really direct. Such defects do affect the decay of their nature, which is liable to dissolution, but these creatures receive their mode of being by the will of their creator. This is completely separate from the fall. There is violence separate and preceding the fall. Um, or here from the free choice of the will. The defect, however, would not deserve blame unless it were voluntary. Consequently, it would be absurd to say that temporal things ought not to decay. It's just you can't, you almost you can't be clear of that, except then we go down. Death occurred on a day when our first parents did what God had forbidden. The bodies lost the privileged condition they had had, the condition mysteriously maintained by nourishment from the tree of life, which would have been able to preserve them from sickness and from the aging, that should be from, sorry, from the aging process. When Adam and Eve therefore lost their privileged state, their bodies became subject to disease and death, like the bodies of animals, and consequently subject to the same drive by which the animals desire. So it was... Uh, they lost something special that was that put them in a different state than animals. We don't have to argue from an Augustinian tradition that somehow the cosmos is lost. So let me briefly give a couple of con some conclusions of this, what I've argued here, and then turn over to conversation so uh, we can engage with this in other levels or uh, critiques that you see. So I think, first off, this offers a case study demonstrating the difference between a doctrine and the, author, uh, the original authorial comments. I came into this thinking, so as I told you about my intellectual crisis, it's because I had been, even though I was trained under two of the best Augustine scholars, I trained, if, if you know them, know these names, I trained under uh, Robert Marcus and Gerald Bonner. You just can't do better than that. I had great scholars, and despite all that they taught me, I got this wrong. Because other parts of the tradition, other reading I did, like John Hick and like some of these other theologians I read, um, presented Augustine as suggesting that the, that, uh, the fall d divided the world from God. And this is a long-standing tradition. This is not just in the last few years. This is over hundreds of years this tradition developed. And I got this wrong despite the brilliant teaching I received. So it's no fault of Gerald or Roberts. Um, and they certainly didn't think that. I went back to look at their works after. They had both passed away by the time I came to this realization, so I couldn't question them on it. But I can't find anywhere in their works that they suggested something. So despite their good teaching, I got this wrong. Uh, and that can be said, perhaps, of other authors and other parts of the tradition. So I'd like you to think about this first as a case study and think about this as an exemplum of how we can get something wrong and it can become deeply embedded and uh, perhaps set us up to miss misuse, and then create other havoc for us. In Augustine terms, it's wrong to describe violent physical and biological acts in nature as evil. Evil is the direct relation to privation, the corruption within souls, not decay, which is endemic within a natural order. Original purity is found then in spiritual reasoning creatures, not describing a state of an original physical uh, purity, if you will, uh, unchangeable purity in a corporeal world. This is not about nature. Um, 
I didn't go in enough into Ratso to say number four. I skipped over that briefly, so I'll, uh, I'll speed past that one. Number five, I do think this, um, you, you will often hear it said in the history of thought that the 12th century offered us the discovery of the natural world. Well, I think, you know, that was, came uh, uh, a good seven centuries before that. On both the, the Greek side with the Cappadocians that I was mentioning and on the Latin side with Augustine. Uh, that might have, some of that might have been lost, but uh, there was good work done before that. I, just as an interesting point, Augustine can allow for change and variance, but I think, you know, only so far. So if we, you couldn't, uh, I think Augustine, uh, if he were here, I don't know what he would do about uh, modern, uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, how we manage contemporary biological evolution. Uh, whether uh, it would be within Darwinian thought or the extended Darwinian thought. Either way, I don't, I think he would have a problem with saying that uh, uh, with a notion that things could be um, uh, completely accidental because there's got, he has got a sense of an underlying blueprint. Um, it could allow for change, but it has to be within God's intended design. So uh, we might not see now the current form but whatever the forms are, are going to conform to the intent of God. Um, so the idea of emergence, as we often, uh, as we deal with it in scientific terms, um, if it is separate from the intended design of God, if emergence is handled that way, then I think certainly Augustine would have problems with that. Uh, there are different ways, perhaps, of wrestling through that. So uh, in the final point, then, that... Um, after the fall, humans are alienated from creation. Nowhere do I find Augustine saying the corporeal world has itself metaphors. I mean, otherwise, we end up with having to say odd things like Adam couldn't get a sunburn. Uh, by the way, uh, he did think, uh, I, it's clear that he thinks of a real at historical Adam. I think there are good reasons to question and challenge that, but it's clear for Augustine that he thinks in terms of, of an actual Adam and an actual Eve. I don't think he was so ignorant about the, well, he wasn't strong in Hebrew, as we know. I think he understood that those were uh, perhaps more typological names, but he did think of them as actual historical figures. But we don't have to think about um, pain in the physical world only coming as a result of the fall, or that grass couldn't turn brown as a result of the fall. Cataclysms happen. Um, the... Uh, he does think, though, that we become, the, the key thing is that Augustine thinks we become alienated from the fall. So the misinterpretation, the misapplication was not to think that the fall becomes alienated from God, but for Augustine, it's clearly humans become alienated from the cosmos. What the fall does for Augustine is we can no longer engage well with the cosmos. And I think for Augustine, particularly how this shows is we have, what it does is it introduces suffering into the equation. And I don't know that it, that it's not clear to me what, whether it introduces pain into the equation, but it certainly introduces the spiritual uh, concept of suffering, that we suffer in relationship to the world around the cosmos um, as a result of the fall. I'm not, I, 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 some of you may have a better idea on this. I'm, it's not clear to me whether um, he would have thought that pain was introduced, and that could be perhaps an interesting conversation. So I hope that is, provides a helpful tool. So you'll perhaps see where I've come out on this in terms of this existential or more intellectual crisis, not existential, it's intellectual crisis I had. What I find is that I can, you know, it's, it's not as if it all fits together neatly, but uh, from the framework of doing Augustinian theology, I don't need to uh, uh, throw out what I understand about, the na about nature that I learned from uh, the scientific, my scientific colleagues around me in which I work with, uh, nor do I need to challenge them on a, to reject it from a purely Augustinian framework, and vice versa. I, I find uh, through this that it's challenged me to be more careful about the tradition by which I assert what can and cannot work well together, and uh, a need for greater care and sensitivity 
Um, and before I turn off my uh, screen share, I just put up here the famous quote of Augustine on the need for churchmen to be careful about what they say about the natural world, which often gets, you will hear quoted by many people. It's a lovely quote, uh, but basically saying we need, uh, those in the church need to be awfully careful about what they say about the natural world, lest uh, in misunderstanding what they don't know that much about, they scare people away from the, the scriptures and from the church when and get turned away from what the church ought to know best and care most about, which is the doctrine of atonement. Uh, so a, uh, a salutary lesson, perhaps, from Augustine there. So, Paul, back to you. Big thank you again for your seminar. Um, and for all the illumination that you've given us and the correction to our um, perhaps erroneous notions that we've been harboring about Augustine all these years. Uh, and thank you to everybody who contributed questions as well. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, um, but clearly people are still hanging around. So although I've gone 10 minutes over time, um, I hope you'll forgive me. But I'm going to hand it back to Joshua to uh, um, wind things up. Okay, Joshua? Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have, what a fascinating discussion on nature and Augustine and our, and our various questions that came out, neuroscience. Um, yes, this was, I hope we can continue these conversations uh, in, in other venues. Uh, but speaking uh, specifically about this venue, next, our next speaker on March 23rd will be Professor Hava Tirosh Samuelson. She'll be speaking on science-engaged theology in Judaism offering a historical overview. We hope you all can join us next time. Uh, yes, which will be on March 23rd, same time. Thank you, everyone.